In the name of the one holy and living God, amen. You are my seventh interim, lucky number seven. Bet it tonight on the Mega Millions, okay? One thing you learn quickly when you enter a new congregation as an interim, especially a system that is under stress from a transition, is that the single most important characteristic you can exude, whether you feel it or not, is calm, confident, competence. I call them the three C's of interim ministry. Like many of you, I have been trained in a whole lot of best practice. And if my collection of three-ringed binders is any indication, then each and every year, all 35 of them of ordained ministry has been filled with continuing education, full of big, fat, three-ring binders that wants me, and consequently all of you, to shine with the light of being the best congregation ever. I have even learned a thing or two from the megachurch conservative evangelicals about knowing the field in which you will be planting the gospel. They rely hugely on marketing data and demographics. And while I clearly understand they will not save us, what I do know is it can prevent a lot of wasted time, a lot of wasted ministry efforts, and a whole lot of frustration. I have been in more than one congregation that speaks the magic words, families with children. Say it three times, click your heels together. The problem is that when you're in a congregation that's in an area that has none, that's a sure and steady path down the road of frustration. And I've had to say that more than once in this line of work. Of course, there's another problem with exuding competence, and that is sooner or later you begin to believe that you actually are. And the last couple of weeks have been full of countless reminders, great and small, that when you believe in your own press, you stop asking important and vital questions about things you don't really understand as well as you should. And most importantly, you start to lose your sense of wonder. And it is precisely our sense of wonder to which Jesus appeals today in the Gospel of Matthew as he tells the parable of the sower. Now, you don't have to be a farmer to realize that this sower is not trained in even the first century best practices of farming. This person, this sower, flings seed everywhere everywhere on unplowed ground that contains rocky soil, thorny soil, shallow soil, and of course, good soil. What's the point, you might well ask? And frankly, the allegorical interpretation of this parable makes very clear that good soil, surprise, surprise, yields disciples. End of discussion. But the parable and its interpretation, while a pretty easy explanation of why folks hear the word that Jesus proclaims and either don't understand it or that more of us get planted than bear fruit, leaves me with sometimes a fair and altogether too depressing assessment of the church. It's really easy to just kind of succumb to that. And in fact, the problem with that interpretation, which was actually written in a time of huge and historic persecution, 
The problem with it is it's the same as relying on my own competence. Where is the power of God in this to make the impossible possible? Where is an understanding of the Holy Spirit that creates in even the most hardened hearts and lives the soil that allows the word and work of God to grow? Because as a person who has served church a long time, that is the scenario I see more often than the fortunate few who grow in good soil. When did spreading the gospel of God's love co become constrained or defined by my limits or someone else's? And there's another more problematic assumption in the interpretation of this scripture, and that has to do with this whole business of scarcity. We don't have enough disciples because the seed that is the gospel didn't land in a good place. I guess we'll go home now. There are a thousand excuses, all culminating in another set of what I call the seven last words of the church. Now, I know you've heard that those are, we have always done it that way. <laughs> but I have a new set. <laughs> if I don't do it, who will? That's equally deadly because it assumes a belief that we will never have enough or be enough. And I don't believe that's the God we serve. So, how do we deal with this parable? One writer I saw this week said, Jesus and his teachings are not a helpful additive like protein power, powder in a fruit smoothie. I love that. I just had to say it to you because it's so wonderful. But in fact, the resurrection of Jesus is God's cosmic solution to our central problem, which is also cosmic in scope. In Jesus, God breaks through the power of everything and anything that separates us from God, and especially those biggies, sin and death. To be in Christ Jesus, is always and everywhere to be in someone greater than oneself. This is what in love and out of love God does for us. This is why the sower follows no first century Palestinian farmer's best practices and just throws seed everywhere and abundantly. And regardless of where the seed falls, there is an abundance of grain. Regardless of our hardened, thorny, shallow selves, God makes incredibly faithful disciples out of us. If I've picked up anything from the Presbyterians, resistance to God is useless. Resistance to God is useless. And God is committed to more than all of us simply keeping on, keeping on. Everywhere and every person is a place of God's care and vision for a plentiful harvest. Jesus speaks of abundance even when in the previous verses of this passage that we don't hear, Jesus has been thoroughly rejected by his family and his hometown. It is a reminder that the power of love and vision of a community can be sown and flourish even in the most hostile environments. I learn anew as I enter this community every day 
that hope and possibility emerge out of all of you, not because of my expertise, but because of who God is and what God is doing among you. And we may never see the fruit of what is being sown by God in each and every one of us this day. But of this I am sure, those seeds are here in abundance. And what God can do with those is more than we can ever ask for or imagine. Amen. Thank you.